Colonel X. And, and uh, let's, just, let's just start from the beginning. First of all, why did you write this book? When I first started writing UFO Highway, it had nothing to do with Dulcie. That's a big thing that most people have to try to readily understand right off the top. It had nothing to do with Dulcie. Everything about UFO Highway had to do with Area 51, uh, Human Origins, and uh, some work that I had been doing on something called Transient Digital Audio Phenomena. Um, UF, uh, Dulcie came about in 2010 when I had this encounter, uh, this meeting with this gentleman. Well, he was a retired United States Air Force colonel. Um, but the reason why, to answer your question, the reason why I wrote the book uh, was because I had already been doing a lot of research in uh, ufology, um, following, you know, the whole Area 51 phenomena, uh, you know, local triangle UFO sightings here in California, which I thought were the, you know, the TR-3B1 and TR-3B whatever, you know, just a bunch of different craft that I knew about, was learning about from people like Michael Schratt and various others. Um, so I was trying to consolidate a lot of information that I had on Area 51 and what my feelings, what my thoughts and feelings are, uh, were on Area 51. Then this guy that I had worked with at a semiconductor company pops back into my life, uh, gets me in touch with this colonel, and the rest is history. That portion of the book has seemed to have taken hold uh, into, you know, the UFO community and... Um, it is what it is. It's UFO Highway, and it's um, something that I I don't regret doing it. Um, you know, sometimes I feel bad that my human origin section gets overlooked, mm. but um, mm-hmm. that, that's 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 why I did uh, UFO Highway, the book. Well, most people are. I, I think everybody is this this air of mystery. First, it was Area 51. Whoa, well, Area 51, you know. And then Dulce started coming into play, and and then you know I guess I, I was just reading in the intro that this whole because I was going to ask you about this on air, and we might as well just address it a little bit right now. This whole Thomas Costello um, bit of, of yeah. information, that interview. Uh, so what about what about that interview first of all? Because I read it, I was like, whoa, this is intense. Um, is it real? Um, how much does that interview? sort of mesh with what uh Colonel Lex had to tell you. Well when I when I well when I started looking into Dulcie, um the the first thing I wanted to know was just Tom, Thomas Edwin Costello, right? I wanted to know everything I could about the guy, what the the whole John Lear connection was to Ann West, what was the Ann West connection to Thomas Costello, who was Bruce Allen Walton you know, and uh, what what is this information? What information, if any, does John Rhodes have? You know, besides hearsay and behind, besides everybody else's information on Dulcie, um, and that's what that's that's what I wanted to know. Just like you know everybody else, and what I found was through talking to the colonel is that Thomas Edwin Costello does not exist, nor does his son, nor does his wife. I personally did extensive research on trying to find if such a person. You know, supposedly he was a sergeant in the military, um, in the Air Force. I tried looking uh, in the uh, the U.S. Uh, Social Security Death Index. So, I mean, everywhere that I could look to try and find, uh, you know, the existence of this person, including the town that he was born in, uh, nothing turned up. You know, I found, I ended up finding a Thomas... E. Costello in Roswell, New Mexico, of all places, but it, it wasn't him. It, it didn't match up. The age didn't match up, and uh, <coughs> and so I'm not for certain that that person exists. I'm, well, I believe I believe that the whole Thomas Costello and all that information is disinfo. It's disinformation that was put out there because in case the real story ever got out, like. The, the colonel's information, which is, I believe, 100% real, the, the Bruce Allen Walton, the Branton story, or the Jason Bishop, the Tal LaBeth story, all that information, that's disinfo. Everything that John Lear has and Ann West, what they have is disinformation. You know, I, I'm a big fan of John Lear's, actually. I've been following John Lear for a long time. And, you know, I... 
I follow up closely on all the work that he does with re- respects to the moon. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know for a fact that there's a moon base. I know that there's a gray base being operated there. I know that there's facilities and whatnot on the moon. Mm-hmm. Strangely enough, John Lear absolutely refuses to talk to me. He he does interviews all the time on YouTube, blog talk, radio, every radio show you can imagine. But the one person he refuses to talk to is me. And the, the reason why he refuses to talk to me, I, I mean, I'm speculating on this, but it's because the colonel knew him. And he worked with the colonel. Uh, the colonel worked with with John Lear back when John Lear was doing, you know, stuff for the CIA. So, and, and he's mentioned in the book UFO Highway, and that's why John Lear won't talk to me. Uh, I, I sent him my phone number. I've sent him my email address. He's good, close, personal friends with Kerry Cassidy, who I'm close personal friends with, but it just uh, never materializes. So you tell me, why won't he talk to me? It's because in the book he's mentioned, and it just a li- it's just a little bit too close to home for him. And why he participates in the disinformation story, you know, with the, these, uh, you know, this whole Thomas Edwin Costello business, I don't know. He doesn't need, maybe it's because he's frightened. Who knows? I don't know. Well, that's, or maybe, you know, the, maybe he believes it. Maybe he believes it. Maybe he believes it. Well, well my, does anybody out there really have 100% of the information? And my question is this, um, because, you know, yeah, it, it, it's hard really sometimes to know who's got the disinfo and who doesn't have the disinfo. Um, and, and I don't know how people really are, are able to really pick from that. But back again to the whole thing with Costello, so is what he had to say is what Colonel X had to say because obviously we I, I don't I don't know and I didn't get a chance to read the book beforehand. Is it that different? Was there no war, for instance? Was there no war between the Greys and the humans and in Well areas? that's why I'm calling well that's why I'm calling it disinformation because there was a battle there. Nineteen seventy nine, that's why the colonel was in Dulce in the first place. He was working out of uh, McClellan Air Force Base uh, here in Northern California, North Highlands, California, which is just north, north east of Sacramento, California, and North Highlands uh, today is it's it's uh, it's now a civilian, you know, place of commerce. It's not even a military base anymore. But McClellan Air Force Base at the time was pretty damn busy, and. In 1979, he was working with a group, a classified group that responded. It was a medical detachment, a classified medical detachment that responded to what he said were Type X events. And Type X events were kind of imagine the X Files inside the military. That's what this was. That's what this was. So if something of a mysterious, you know, nature occurred, like an accident or a death or some type of a catastrophe, his job was to be deployed there immediately, where he would make. Um, you know, uh, on-the-spot determinations whether certain individuals were, you know, able to return to duty or, or whether they were fit to, you know, return to duty or not. Um, uh, he had the power to, you know, discharge people from the military immediately or send them to prison or send them to hospitals, you know, whatever it took to get people that were no longer functioning on a on – a, uh, at a, you know, at, at, at a level that the military was, you know, expecting of them, you know, out of the picture. So right. in 1979, he went to Edwards Air Force Base where he met up with another group of individuals, uh, and then he flew into a classified location called Dulce. He had never heard of Dulce, didn't know where the hell it was. Uh, matter of fact, everything he was learning about Dulce was on the trip there uh, from Edwards Air Force Base. Once they got to Dulce, everything became clear to him. He thought that they were, that all of the briefing documentation was talking about a Native American community Mm -hmm. that lived inside of these caverns there. Then Mm -hmm. it became aware to him that these were not Native Americans that they were talking about. These were greys. These were grey aliens. Or alien to him, aliens of some sort. He didn't know anything about greys or anything at that point. He knew about the, the whole UFO phenomena, but he didn't know about interaction with Grays, you know, between the the military <clears throat> at that point. <clears throat> so 
that's yeah. The, the, there was a battle in Dulcie, and that's why I believe the Thomas the Thomas Costello uh, information was put out there. By the way, Phil Schneider really did work there. Phil Schneider was really a part of that whole story. Now, Phil Schneider came about after the Thomas Edwin Costello uh, business, you know. But again, that stuff was put out there as disinformation in case the real story ever got out. Phil Schneider gave bits and pieces of the tr- of the of the real story. Um, some of it he was di- he was uh, he too was guilty of putting out a little bit of disinfo. But I mean, he really was telling the truth. But what he did was is he thought he was protecting himself by omitting certain pieces. Mm-hmm. But it didn't, didn't matter. They still killed him anyway, and he really did work at Dulcie, and the colonel confirmed this. Mm. Okay. So- but you're sure through, um, I guess, through the light test and, uh, and uh, that two, two light test. Two light test. Okay. Right. The, the Which I still code. have, I still have the results of those polygraph examinations. Okay. And I'm still in touch with the person who gave the polygraph examination. Matter of fact, that person also put me in touch with another resource who is, who's done over 1,800, uh, 1800 uh, forensic document examinations for the FBI here in California for offices out of San Jose, Sacramento, San Francisco to validate the authenticity of the documentation that I have. What is the documentation that I have? I have a DD-214 document, which is the military discharge document of the colonel, <coughs> which shows that he was, in fact, somewhere – called Rio Riva Scientific, you know, Technological uh, Underground Auxiliary. Well, Rio, Rio Ox is what it's called, and it's in Rio Riva County. Now, those are the clues that are that tell us that there's something there in Dulcie. I called the people in Dulcie, you know, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and they said that there's nothing there. Um, I guess there's a whole bunch of people out there that are claiming to have taken this document and found that it was a fraud. It was a, It's a fake document. I'm telling you right now that's bullshit. And there's a lot of there's a lot of proof that these guys are being paid off by somebody to launch this disinfo, you know, this again, another disinformation campaign. Who in their right mind is going to, who are you going to trust more? <clears throat> I filed a standard form a stand a standard form 180 with the uh, National Personnel Records Center, sent it to them. I had done so many times before they're owning my own software company and a California multiple awards schedule. All of this is verifiable through the state of California. You can call the you can call the state of Cal, call up the state of California and verify all of this. Mm-hmm. I have filed and I have had expedite DD two fourteen uh, documents expedited through filing the standard form one eighty. So I knew the process. It's to verify whether or not a person <coughs> is <coughs> legitimately <coughs> excuse me <coughs> legitimately an active duty reservist or a retired from the from uh, from uh, service, you know, because when you when you go when you put out a bid on a contract, a request for proposal or a request for offer, you get points when you hire veterans, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I the process. I went through it uh, with the with the assistance of the colonel. I went through it. I got the the, the DD two fourteen back. I showed it to, to, to quite a few people. There are actual people that held this document uh, in Angel Fire, New Mexico, when I was really naive at the time, when I was first coming out with it. I took it out there. John Greenwald, Jr., uh, uh, let's see, who else? Uh, Norio Hayakawa, Jerry Pippen, uh, Dennis Balthazar, uh, Janet Saylor. Quite a few people actually held the original document that I got back from the National Personnel Records Center. Mm-hmm. Now... One guy took the document, a, a, a UFO investigator, that's what he calls himself, he took the document, went to a federally funded organization, and he literally thought, you know, that they were going to tell him, oh, yes, Mr. UFO investigator, there is an underground base with aliens in northern New Mexico that we're working, that the government is working in collusion with. Do you think, in your right mind, that this guy was going to get that answer, David. Did, did, do you think they were going to tell him that? Uh, no, I would think that they probably would not tell him that. And they did. And they, I mean, 
they're like, oh, this is a fraudulent document. It did not come from from the National Personnel Records Center. Nothing about it is real. And you know what? It's bullshit because I know where the document came from. I'll take a lie detector test. Okay? So there's another interesting bit of information. I worked in Silicon Valley for over 20 years. And I was the first corporate webmaster for 3Com Corporation. Uh, I had an opportunity to work for over a year with Netscape Communications, you know, way back in the 90s. Uh, this is just my, ex- my experience within Silicon Valley is extensive. I have friends in high places throughout Silicon Valley. One of them works at PayPal. This investigator that took this document and claims that it's a fraud received a $10,000 payment via PayPal. Okay? Actually, just, just shy of ten, just shy of $10,000. It was uh, like nine, $9,999 exactly. Now, why would this person be receiving a payment from a construction company out of Marysville, California, which is right in the shadow of Beale Air Force Base, and a construction company that works for the Air Force Base and contracts under uh, under the Department of General Services, which specializes in, in concrete uh, bunkers. And, and here's what's funny. That company that sent that money to this so-called researcher, the guy that's you know launching this, this hate campaign against me, trying to assail my character, which he's failed to do because nobody believes him. The only people that believe him are, are dumbasses like Stanton Friedman and, and, and Scott Ramsey, those two guys who were in business together anyway. Uh, so here's, here's my point. That construction company just happened to do work for Denver International Airport and the Hickory Apache Reservation. Isn't that funny? Mm-hmm. That, it's very funny. So uh, I think that um, they're afraid. They know that UFO Highway, the Dulce interview, is the real deal. They know that, you know, that eventually the disinformation put out there by Ann West or Shirley Hinckley, which is her real name, she's on Facebook, can't stand her, um, because she knows what she's doing. She's being paid by somebody to lie. Uh to to veer people away from the truth of what's really happening at Dulcie, which is a tragedy, by the way. Um, Let's go back a little bit. Let me, let me backtrack a little bit because because I want to make sure that we do talk about Dulcie, but I also want to talk about this human origin thing, too, because I find that equally fascinating, and I don't want to escape the fact that I want our listeners to know you offer up a lot of information about that. But now let's back to this whole thing about the disinfo thing, because that's one of the things that spins my head around and it really gets my goat, because it's like, who do you really trust and what is the purpose? Okay, now here's my thing. If somebody's putting out information, like Castillo or John Lear or Stanton Friedman or whatever, they put out information, a verifying, first of all, that there are UFOs or that there is a base in Dulce. Now, that's information. That's not necessarily disinformation. That's, that's actually information that's usable, it's mind expanding, it takes people to a more aware knowledge. So right, that's the good part of it. Where does the bad part of it come in? The lies. The lies are the bad part. So for instance, you know, getting people all hyped up on this this idea that it's reptilians that are there, not grays. What does that do? That throws them off the real track. That throws them off the real trail. Um telling the this story, which is uh, really outlandish, you know, but I mean, well, even even the story that the colonel told me is outlandish at first, but the more and more you listen to the colonel's story, the more and more you realize, hey, there's a lot of facts backing all this shit up. You know, this guy is is talking like an insider. I mean, he knows what he's talking about. You know, a lot of the stuff that that, that came out of the, the Branton story, the, you know, the uh, the Dulcy papers or whatever they call their, you know, their version of events. Um, it just sounds really schizophrenic. It's all over the place. You know, it's like multiple personalities all, you know, participating in this hodgepodge of, of disinfo. Uh, and there's a, and uh, again, the bad part are the lies. So, you know, I, I don't know. It, because I'm just, it's not, individual to decide what they believe is real and what they believe is not real. Now, I, I, I put my career on the on the line here 
You know, I've really put a lot on the line. I sacrificed the marriage. I've, I've gone through a lot. You know, financially, I was nearly destitute at one point, lost my home, lost my car, you know, everything, lost my business. Um, I gave up a lot to get this information out there. And then they still tried to destroy me further. So it's up I to the take it nobody's right. giving you $9,999.99 to PayPal is what you say. Nobody. <laughs> nobody. Every, every cent I have, I have to make on my own. So, you know, I feel feel it's just – I just feel that uh, people need to decide for themselves. Well, let me – and I think that, you know, I I think your book book is is totally, totally worth reading. Um, And we would have been reading as much of it as I possibly could, and and people were staying with me, and and so obviously – And I want to thank everybody who stayed with you. I mean, my internet, I don't know what happened. Uh, I had some friends over earlier – and sure enough, it went down in front of them. And then I got it back up. They left, and then it went down again. And I just and it's a Sunday, so trying to get the cable company to help was just impossible. Well, that's okay. Now let's go back to let's talk about the Grays for a little bit then, because it seems like okay, you know, let's let's let's. I don't know how you deal with this in your book because unfortunately I haven't been able to really read through the whole thing, but. Uh, obviously, according to Stephen Greer's Disclosure Project and a lot of the people that got up and testified there, we are dealing with multiple races of extraterrestrials. In your book, I know you mentioned three or four. Is there any correlation between those two, or are you just dealing with the races that this particular person spoke about? Yes, this particular person talked about. Uh, yes. now, but, <clears throat> well, he talks about the grays. He talks about the Austra Albus, which are essentially the descendants of the Anunnaki. And then he talks about the progenitors, which were the original group that, you know, essentially uh, created the Anunnaki. So the, the Anunnaki created these greys. They created them here. But from what I understand, the, there are off-world greys as well. They're not, there's a terrestrial group of greys that were created to essentially to manage us, modern human. Uh, the modern human population, and uh, but there are off-world groups of greys. So, you know, I I, me- I recently started talking with Jay Widener, who's done a lot of work uh, through examining the Nag Hammadi codices, uh, which um, are the writings of the Gnostics, and the Gnostics talk about the archons. And the archons, they guess what, man? The archons match up word for word with this progenitor group. They they okay. Match- Match up with this, you know, which includes the Anunnaki and the Austro Albus all the way down the line. It's this off-world group that is here among us, and uh, they they operate on a lower frequency, essentially feeding off of our pain, our anger, our sorrow. Um, it's it's really sickening, and um, and this group, and this is where it gets crazy, but this group is real. They're here, and they are. You know, like David David Icke calls them the reptilians. You know, Alex Jones calls them the the globalists. He's elitist. Um, it's it's all the same group. It's the one percent. Matter of fact, it's not even the one percent versus the ninety nine percent. It's it's the fraction of a percentage that's in charge of the one percent. Right. That's my friend. It is the super uber elitist that control. This planet, you know, when all you have to do is take a roll call at the Bilderberg Group, and everyone that's part, that's there because of of old money and familial royal familial lineages, those that's the group, that's the group. You know, Barack Obama was invited there to the Bilderberg meeting with uh, with uh, Hillary Clinton. Remember, do you remember when Barack uh, was uh, in the 2008 election? Was supposed to be on the airplane, and they had all of the uh, press corps on there, and, and they tricked them, and they locked the plane up, and they took off, and the press corps thought Obama was on the plane, but he had secretly took off for the next three days. Oh no, I didn't. You remember that? Two thousand eight. No, no, no. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Just, 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 it was pretty controversial, actually. The press corps was pretty pissed off about it. There's a lot about it in the news. Uh, yeah, what happened was that Barack Obama was supposed to be on a plane. And uh, he was supposed to, be, you know, be going to the next, you know, election destination, you know, for the campaign destination. But instead, he secretly got off the plane 
and was whisked away. And for the next three days, the press did not know where the hell Barack Obama was. Well, he and Hillary Clinton were at the Bilderberg meeting. And uh, Barack Obama was indoctrinated. And Barack was indoctrinated because he's actually a relative of George Bush and Dick Cheney. They all have blood ties back to European aristocratic families that, you know, again, which have ties to the Bavarian Illuminati. This is all provable. This is all fact. Um, as a matter of fact, in my book that's coming out, I talk about this. I expose uh, connections between the United Nations, the Theosophical Society, uh, Freemasonry, and how they're all interrelated despite the fact that they have different agendas on the surface and different operating, you know, uh, uh, you know, means that the, uh, despite that, underneath it, they're all the same group. They all are partake in this Luciferian society. It has nothing to do with the devil. It's just it, it, it's just called the Luciferian society, and uh, it's part of this uh, this group. And I'm telling you, man, these are the these are the real rulers of this planet. They're the ones in charge. They're the ones that are ensuring that every westernized nation on the planet has a centralized banking system that is owned by the Rothschilds. Look, the, 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 the list is very small of the remaining countries that do not have a centralized banking company that isn't owned in part or in, or in whole by the Rothschilds. You mm-hmm. know who those countries are? Let's see, Syria, uh, North uh, Korea. Iran. Iran, Iran, North you say Korea, North, North Korea, and and, and 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 Libya was on that list. Right, Libya was on the Not list. Not anymore. Now yep. Libya is our book. Despite despite what just happened on nine eleven in Libya, that wasn't the what what happened in Libya on nine eleven. That group, those were some holdout militants that that uh, you know hate the West, hate the United States, and want Sharia law. What you need to understand is that 80 to 90 percent of the people in Libya are pro-American, pro-Western governments. They want, you know, the kind of democracy that we have. Um, and a lot of people are not aware of that because only bits and pieces make it out, you know, from from the mainstream media. That's the truth. But we killed Gaddafi for for many reasons. For one reason, we wanted the the massive gold de- deposits that he had. He had a huge gold. Uh, you know, hoard uh, a huge hoard. Let's call it what it is—a hoard of gold. Mm-hmm. Uh, matter of fact, enough that he was in position to create a new currency called the dinar throughout mm-hmm. the entire continent of Africa, much like you have the euro in uh, in the uh, the Europe across the European Union in uh, Europe. Mm-hmm. You know, um, he was going to create something called the dinar, which was an African currency that was backed by gold. It was not going to partake in this international, you know, uh, 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 dollar standard that is the uh, basis for most all currencies around the globe right now, something that the Chinese don't want. Anyhow, when the Rothschilds and the, the, you know, the, the Bush administration, then later the Barack administration, once we all – Figured all that out over here in the United States. We said, nope, not going to happen. So in less than three months, in less than three months, when it took us, you know, over 11, we're still in Iraq. You know, we were still we were in Iraq for over 11 sure. years. In less sure. than three sure. months, we took him out. We took him out. We, we, under the guise of a U.N.-led coalition, we killed his ass, and we got him out. All that gold is missing now. All that gold is missing. But... What they're doing is that there's going to be a centralized banking institution in place for the new de- democratic, you know, Libya. And well, they're going to be to have a currency that's on a fractional reserve system that's backed by nothing, that's printed on toilet paper. Well, you know, you have to be careful what you wish for. But let me get back to this really quickly, though, because this is great info that you're filling in. Um, but, okay, so, you know, we're talking about the Rothschilds. We're talking about the people that are behind it. And those, are the alien, those are the human alien hybrids that live amongst us today. Okay. Where did they come from and who created them? Are you still there? Oh, I guess they didn't.
All right, and we're back Ooh. after that question. I'm going to ask Anthony again, and let's get the question on air. Anthony, where did these people come from? It's from the Sirius star system, and it's a known fact that many of the contactees here, uh, beginning with Betty and Barney Hill and thousands of people prior to Betty and Barney Hill, um, that, you know, they came from the Sirius star system, um, Zeta Reticuli, you know, there's various places where they came from, but the the progenitor group originated in uh, Zeta Reticuli, ended up in Sirius, and then landed in our solar system because they were looking for a new place to live and um, new resources, and they were looking for what they felt was Mars at the time. But there was a cataclysmic event that took place on Mars, and it forced them to move to Earth. As prior to that, Mars had been uh, perfect for their biological, you know, makeup. And mm-hmm. uh, but after that cataclysmic event, they were forced to leave. It, I mean, it didn't happen overnight. It took them like a hundred thousand years to uproot off of Mars and then ultimately make it onto Earth. You got to remember, this is over a course of a million years. You know, the migration, right? Uh, and and and. Uh, who, what was on Earth when they got here? What, what, were there humans on Earth? What was on Earth? What was happening here? Well, yeah, they were. There were humans on Earth, but they were primitive hominid, hominids. You know, okay. they were just uh, you know imagine, you know uh, imagine like Neanderthal and uh, you know Cro-Magnon, you know those types of primitive hominids. Now, what's interesting is that when you when you look at the the information that the colonel provided from his understanding of, from the the information that was deciphered off of the gray archaeological tablets that they found in Dulce, it correlates and matches up with a lot of the work from people like Zacharias Hitchin and mainstream academia. Let me explain. According mm-hmm. to these grays, some 250 to 300,000 years ago, is when these Austra Albus, these descendants of the Anunnaki, decided that because of the complaining of these Aloha Gray, these Greys, these you know demigods, these whatever that's how they refer to them, they no longer wanted to be the labor force. You know, the, the it was an intelligent labor force, right? You know, mm-hmm. it, imagine like a bunch of scientists, a bunch of uh, you know uh, people. You know, not like slaves and not like, you know, building the pyramids like, you know, what what you imagine from Hollywood in the 1940s kind of labor. You know, just doing this stuff, you know, just like like you would have a job today working like in a factory or in a laboratory, that kind of thing. They didn't want to do that anymore. And they said, why should we do that when there's this population here? And then these Austra, these Austra Albus, these descendants of the Anunnaki said, well, they're not capable of doing the type of work that you do. So what they did was is they took them, genetically modified them, and over time they created, they actually created a group that could serve two purposes. One, that they could interbreed with, the Austra Albus, because the Greys, there's no way that the Greys could interbreed with them. That's my understanding. But the Austra Albus could, and they actually needed to because they were dying. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the second reason was that, okay, well, we'll have this new group that is highly intelligent enough such that they can service both both of us, both the Greys and the Austro Albus. What the Greys didn't know was that the Austro Albus had already been warned by their forefathers, the Anunnaki, and their their you know uh, well their progenitors that you better be careful and don't trust the Greys entirely because they could become too powerful at some point down the line, especially with our lineages being so sick. And that's what that's why they ended up in Dulce. They shipped them off to Dulce. They actually infected them so that they would die. That's why their numbers are so small today, that they would die off slowly but surely. And they shipped them there under the guise that it was so that they could heal there without, you know, contamination from, you know, all the, the busy societies that were happening on the other side of the planet. Uh okay. you see some 25,000 years ago when they brought them there nothing was going on pretty much but okay so got, okay now you I, I got I got to stop here and throw some questions out okay were these are these the same grays that are running around in sources abducting people those are the grays that are abducting people today with and a matter of fact 
the United States government is abducting people today with the help of the Greys under these MyLab, these military abduction scenarios. Okay. Second, the Greys were there at Dulce already then. So that's what that, so they were already there before okay. the United States government even discovered oh, them. Or oh, how, did, okay. how did that happen? How did that happen that the United States government just chanced upon a bunch of Greys underground? 1938, when the United States was looking for its future home for its atomic development program, they were in California, they were in Arizona, Nevada, Colorado, Utah, and New Mexico looking for this place. Ultimately, they settled on, you know, the uh, uh, parts of, you know, uh, well, Los Alamos. They, they settled on New Mexico as the primary home, and then with subsequent, you know, uh, secondary and tertiary locations throughout Colorado, Nevada, and California, and Arizona. But in 1938, there was this group from Edwards Air Force Base, which at the time was called Murak Army Airfield, that was uh, commissioned to assist at, at the ground level these pilots that were surveying the entire Southwest. One of these groups ended up in northern New Mexico, right where the southern Colorado border is they found these massive caverns inside of this place called the Archuleta Mesa. Inside of the Archuleta Mesa, they found evidence of some type of a battle near the openings of one of these uh, massive caverns. And uh, they found dead alien gray bodies next to dead American Indians, Apache bodies. Uh, it's controversial, but there may have been some, you know, some Utes there, but uh, my understanding is uh, from the colonel was based on the clothing. It's they're almost positive that it was 100% Apache. Uh, uh, it was the, the Apaches that were in there. So that's how they found the place. And within within several years, the place was sealed up. And you know, it's a very complex story. You'd have to read UFO Highway to understand all, how all of it came about. But within, I want to say, five to six years, the, the place was sealed up, and we were working with the Greys through a technological exchange program, which is why, you know, from that point onward, you see this exponential shift and augmentation in the level of technology that we have. Just think about it. In, 19, in the 1940s, we were not that sophisticated. But by the 1950s and 1960s, things started to happen. And by the 1970s and 80s, a whole new, oh, yeah. whole new world had emerged. And look where we are today. Now, one point that I, I wanted to finish making was that mainstream academia, you know, talks about this mitochondrial Eve theory, that 250,000 to 300,000 years ago, modern men emerged upright and highly intelligent from the continent of Africa. Doesn't that sound very funny that these great archaeological tablets talked about the genetic intervention of this higher power with this primitive modern, this primitive uh, uh, hominid, thus creating this new modern man that you know began to be you know began to populate the rest of the planet and they emerged from Africa. It just makes a lot of sense to me, David, that. You know, modern man was, you know, j manipulated at that time. Humans, as we are today, were manipulated at that time, and that's when we came on the scene. And that's the reason why you cannot find fossilized evidence of modern humans, you know, like we are today, you know, beyond before that time period. You just ain't going to find it. You'll find Cro-Magnon. You'll find Paleolithic men. You'll find, you know... A Neanderthal, but you're not going to find modern-looking humans as we are today prior to that point, because we did not exist. We did not exist. A couple things, okay? First of all, let me just throw some questions at you from the chat room and get these questions answered, and then we'll try to get back on track. I've got a couple of things I want to say about that as well that really are, you know, because you've sparked some questions in my mind. But here's a question. Uh, do you believe that aliens are working only with the United States government? And that alien is such a catch-all phrase. I don't know if it's grays or not, but are working only with the United States government, or are they working with other foreign governments and 
and are there other Dulce type or Dulce type uh, facilities in other countries? There are Dulce type facilities in other countries. Yes, there are. Um, Alice Springs in Australia, which is where they have the, uh, which is where they have the uh, massive underground facility, uh, which is the. It was built in the 1960s. It's where they they monitor all the satellites, much like Bill Air Force Base does up here in Northern California. Um, that's an underground facility that at one time had grays that were grays that were actually sent there from Dulce. <clears throat> and China, under the Chengdu district, has a massive underground facility, but there are no, no grays there in China. Um, instead, there are Austra Elvis. They're the descendants of the Anunnaki. They're working in collusion with the Chinese government. That's who they have. Uh, in Russia, there are massive underground facilities. Um, I do not know about any connections to Greys or, you know, descendants of these Anunnaki, but uh, I do know that there is some type of an outside ET influence, and it possibly came directly from us, the U.S. Um, you have to understand something. When you start working within the alien paradigm, it's not about this country versus that country. It's about the the, the people that are in charge. It's about the New World Order. It's about the Illuminati, the group, it's, it's about the groups that are in charge and what they are, what, what move they are making on the chessboard. That's who ends up with an alien influence at their respective underground facility. Mm. It's, it's, it's a game changer. It's all different once you get to that level. Has nothing to do with uh, nationalism. Has everything to do with, uh, you know, egalitarian, you know, uh, this, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, an egalitarian type, you know, setup. Like, what have you done for me lately? You know, mm -hmm. who's who's pleading who at what point? You know, this uh, and, and the who is the new world order? Who who's providing what resource to the new world order? That's who gets the assistance. That's who who gets to feel like they're important at that moment in time. And and there's a faction here in the United States that pretty much controls all of that because of what occurred in Roswell, what occurred in San Antonio, New Mexico, what, what occurred in Aztec, New Mexico, um, what, what happened with Barney and Betty Hill. Um, there was, you know, a lot of people get pissed off and think, what, UFOs only land in the, in the United States? Well, in the olden days, back when we started, when we started splitting the atom and... Okay, I'm still in the air. We've had just a little bit of a disturbance. So we Okay, so I'm back, and Anthony, are you still there? Still here. Okay, great. So you were talking, we were talking, you were going through the whole thing about um, people being angry about or saying that UFOs don't only, of course, land here in the United States, and I think you were, you were taking it from there. Go ahead. Yeah, well, yeah, my point was is that in the 1940s, um, a lot of important, you know, yeah, there was, we, we had a lot of interaction with the aliens, uh, you know, the ETs, you know, well, well the Greys from Dulce, uh, everybody, because they were curious, what the hell are these people doing? You know, we were splitting the atom. We were, you know, uh, having these, these uh, nuclear, you know, bombs, you know, go off, at, you know, places like Trinity and whatnot. But that's what caused all the commotion. But, yeah, there's, you know, a lot. So a lot. And then when we found Dulcie, that was the catalyst. That's what put us at the top. You know, for the longest time, we were in control of those grays because we essentially cut them off from their resources, what they needed. Um, because we were sophisticated enough to. Yes, their technology was thousands of years ahead of ours, but we were brutal. We were a, a brutal militaristic force that they were not prepared for. Unlike in, in the 1800s when they, you know, encountered the Apache and they had that battle with the Apache, and, you know, a, a lot of the Greys took casualties, and a lot of Apaches did too, and there was a, they were left there, you know, dead. I think they were they were left there for two reasons. One, the greys were afraid to come back up to the surface because they had never encountered this primitive species to, you know, that was now possessing these firearms like the Apache were. Uh, two, um, maybe it's, it was going to scare off the human population to see all the dead Apache and all the dead greys there, you know, at the entrance of that massive cavern, and that served a purpose for the greys. But 
by the time we got there in 1938, boy, we had a bunch of more, you know, sophisticated arsenal at our disposal. So Okay, but this, that's dealing with the underground graves. Obviously, we're not talking about, say, the, the graves that were in the crash at Roswell, for instance, or the graves that have been piloting saucers. They can't, are they the same? Like, I mean, are they all, because you said there was oh, there's an off-world group of graves, too. So, I mean, how many groups of graves are we dealing with here? Um. I, I don't know how many groups. Um, I just spoke with um, George Lebrono, who's the author of The Alien Mind, and he has a much more, you know, broader picture than I do on the on the the on a, on a good estimation of how many groups of graves there are here, you know, abducting people and uh, and working with the, working in collusion with uh, the dark elements of the hidden government. Um, but I, I don't think it's a lot. I think it's just a select few groups. And they're all from the same, they all hail from the same region of deep space. And they're here for a reason. You know, it's a, you know, we're, we're, we're like a gem in, in the, in, you know, hidden, hidden deep within the forest, you know, you know, at the base of a, at the, at the base of a flowing riverbed, but we're, we're, we're buried deep, you know, within the sediment, you know, it's like, you find it, you know, it's like, what do you do? You know, you're going to hide it, you know, to right back where you, where you found it or something. So you don't want people to get their hands on it. Well, we're that group that they don't want others to get their hands on if there are others out there. I mean, I'm just making and an, trying to make up an analogy, but yeah, we're 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 a precious commodity to them. Yeah, At least of course, yeah, well, we have a gorgeous planet. I mean, it's stunning. I mean, if there's a more beautiful planet, I'm sure there might it probably is. But yeah, I mean, we our planet is just I mean amazing. But here's a question. Uh, does Anthony have any inside knowledge of a secret space program, and how advanced are these human piloted spacecraft? And where is the base for these spacecraft? Do you cover any of that in your book? Yeah, I do. Um, not in not in UFO Highway, but Project Leonid, which is my new book that is coming out. Um, I was just sent footage from an individual in the UK of new space platforms that have been captured captured on video through this advanced telescopic technology. Um, there's actually pictures of it now on YouTube. And if you just type space platforms and uh, Gary McKen McKinnon, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. But I've actually seen them. And they dwarf the International Space Station in, in size. I mean, these things are massive. They're built by the military, the U.S. military. And uh, I think there may even be one that's built by China. Um, I can't confirm that at this point in time, but I know that the Chinese are trying to actively destroy the one that the United States has. Um, there's a lot of, of the, there has already been a prolific weaponization of space. And yes, there's a secret space program. And I talk a lot about a lot of, and there's, there's groups that exist that are out in the open, but nobody knows about them. I'm going to expose them in Project Leonid. So then there are battles in the sky taking place above our head between reverse engineered craft and extraterrestrial craft, you think? Right now there are. Yeah, if you, okay. if you, uh, if you talk to Ed Grimsley, uh, who, who goes out there with tens of thousands of dollars of Gen 3 night vision equipment with his team, Chuck Poloka, and I don't know Dennis's last name, but he's got a team of guys that go out there and they videotape the stuff. And you can quite clearly see engagement between craft in low Earth orbit and high Earth orbit. I mean, it, it's happening. It's up there. Something's going on right above us. You know, when they issue night vision equipment to the uh, to the soldiers in the military, uh, they make it very clear to them. The, one of the first things they tell them is just do your job, you know, and don't look up. Do not use uh -huh. it to look up. Just do your use them for your job. Well, you know, because it's funny, man. I've been looking up at the sky lately because I just, you know, I've been just wanting to just look at the stars. And I swear, mm -hmm. I have seen, I've seen movement. I've seen stars moving at ridiculously rapid speed. Examples, and that's just like, I'm like, what is going on up there? Are my eyes deceiving me? You know, and immediately my thoughts go to Ed Grimsley because he has been on the show, and, and I'm thinking, am I seeing maneuvers up above my, uh, you know, uh, it's, just, it's just for real. But I, I look up again, and yes, that star was there, and now it's over there. And it's like, whoa, okay, uh, I, something's going on, you know. So it's really, really intriguing. Um, 
and worse than that is just like being in ignorance of what's really going on. That sucks. Mm-hmm. Let me let me ask you another question from the chat room. What about the rumored mantis type aliens who are supposed to be the masters of the graves? I don't know anything about that. You don't. Okay. No. But you know, that could be um that could be just a, a you know, a way to reference uh these elitists. You know, well, I, you know I don't know. David Icke calls them reptilians, and he says that they, you know, underneath their human skin, they actually have scales and stuff. You know, at least at one point he said that. Um, I can't confirm that. I have stories on reptilians based on, you know, interviews that I've conducted with people that have come forth to me asking for my help. You know, I'm actually actively helping people right now through Facebook. Um, But the truth is, is that, no, I don't know anything about these mantis-type aliens. They could exist, though. I'm not saying they mm-hmm. don't exist. Mm-hmm. I just personally don't have any information on them. My the, the 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 scope of my knowledge on on aliens is limited to uh, uh, Greys, uh, these Archons or Anunnaki, you know, the mm-hmm. progenitor group. Mm-hmm. And just just now, I'm starting to focus on reptilians. Yeah, because you know, it's it's well, first of all, I mean, it seems like to me. You know, I mean, if you look at the planet itself, just as it is right now with a wide variety of species and, you know, you're always rediscovering, you know, some kind of species, some new species of monkey, some new species of insect and some new species of butterfly. Um, it would almost seem as if the universe itself is full of a wider range of, of entities, you know, and, and types of entities and entities that breathe oxygen, entities that might be, you know, based in another um, I breathe in another element. Um, I would think that they would all. I think I would think that they would all be out there. I mean, just from the example of the planet itself. But that's you know that's how how my thoughts go. Um, I'm familiar with Ike and and, and reptilians. Um, Stuart Swallow, uh, a section of his book. I'm familiar with Stuart. Blue but true blood. That alien in the back uh, in the back of the book and and you know, the Syrians are in the Iran. Particular uh, types uh-huh. of grays. Um, the, uh, and the praying mantis, and I've heard different things about the praying mantis entity. I've heard that they've been nine, and not be nine. So, you know, all of that just, you know, goes hand in hand with what's info and, and, and basically what's disinfo. And, and one doesn't really, you know, who, who's going to know unless obviously you're confronted with, with something yeah. like that. Yeah. You know. Let me ask you a question about because you now did you study Hebrew at, um, or did you to did, did you, <laughs> yes I, I no I didn't study Hebrew what I did uh-huh. was is I've studied um, <clears throat> I've studied the Bible I've studied a lot of uh, cuneiform writings you know I made my best attempt at at, at trying to study Akkadian cuneiform um, there are various online sources uh, there's like the, to the University of Chicago. Um, Lots of online manuscripts are available, and, uh, you know, like the Atrahasis and uh, a lot of the ancient Sumerian writings. So I have a real diverse, you know, I have a real diverse background in what I've studied and, and how it's enabled me to attain this better understanding of human origins. In terms of what the colonel mentioned, the recordings of the graves and their history, and what you know about the Bible, and what you see from the Bible, is there any correlation between those two? Is there a correlation between the archons and the Bible? Is the God of the Bible, is he an extraterrestrial? Get this. What's funny is that organized, or organized religion, which is really a control mechanism of fear, has stripped out every reference of the archons and any off-world entity or any alluding facts, you know, about Jesus or how they want, you know, Christianity to be portrayed, they ripped it out. And then they launched this campaign called the called the uh, Inquisition to kill anybody who was, you know, holding on to any of those any of those uh, older ideas, um, which included, you know, uh, many people within Judaism, right? So mm-hmm. a lot of, there were a lot of monks that were killed for holding on to um, a lot of the Gnostic writings, 
you know, certain monks in 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 Egypt hid the Gnostic writings, you know, from the from the uh, Christian, you know, church, you know, the Catholic Church or the Christian, whatever you want to call it at that time. And uh, fortunately for us, that information was found in the 1940s by these brothers, and uh, we have the full writing of the Nag Hammadi, you know, well, there's, there's there were. Twelve books that, that comprise the Nag Hammadi Codices, which have a lot of the stories that we do know of from the Bible. Same with the Dead Sea Scrolls. Oh, but then again, the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, have a lot of stories that never made it into the Bible. That uh, you know how we understand it today, because you had all these various councils that were set up to ensure that only the information that they wanted in there. Uh, in the this the, you know the modern Bible uh, made it in. That's why the Bible contradicts itself in so many places. You know that's why in some parts of the Bible they refer to you know uh, polytheism as, as opposed to monotheism. You know making references to the gods as opposed to God. You know in the very first book of the Bible in Genesis, you know it talks about it talks about aliens. It talks about you know. You know the 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 sons of you know uh, you know the uh, what is it oh, God I'm at a loss for words right now but the, what, uh, the the Elohim or the yeah yeah the Nephilim you know it talks about the, the Nephilim, Nephilim. Uh-huh. yeah the, the 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 God what is it the the, the the I don't remember the the phrase but it's uh, how the daughters of man and the sons of of, of, of um, Anyway, you know you know what I'm talking about. Right, I know what you're talking about. Well, yeah. I think it says the sons of men and the, the daughters of men and the sons of God. I don't know. God, think. exactly, yeah. Um, but then, anyway. Yeah. So, but, yeah, I just don't have that recollection right now. My mind is, you know, I'm pissed off because the 49ers lost today. But, um, <laughs> no, no, I really don't care about that kind of stuff. I'm just joking. Oh, um, yeah, sure. <laughs> but, no, seriously, um, yeah, so – our understanding today is a warped representation created by uh, an elitist, a group of elitists who, w- who wanted to ensure that what we know is what they want us to know. God forbid we, we understand the whole truth. I mean, just this week alone, you know, really strong supportive evidence has come out showing that, you know what, this Jesus guy, if he did exist, was probably married. You know, right. something that the church doesn't want you to even think about. So, you know, I have my own, you know, feelings on Jesus of whether or not he really existed. And if he did exist, you know, is, you know, maybe he's, I don't know, man. I don't want to get real controversial with regard to religion. But I don't believe anything that organized religion tells me. I just don't. Not anymore. I was born and raised a Catholic. I was baptized a Catholic. I went to Catholic school. But I, you know, I don't really espouse that whole, you know, that whole set of ideas anymore. I can't. Not with all the science that is in front of me. So then my question still stands. Is God an ET? I think God, I, well, I mean... Well, I had the God that well, the people were well, talking about in the Bible, not necessarily the, the source of all. Remember the Bi- remember the Bible is a warped, distorted view of the text that preceded it, which clearly spoke of of a progenitor group. You know, the gods before them were you know the Anunnaki with the Sumerians, you know, or the Dodon tribe in Africa. They talked about their gods, you know. Yes, I think that ultimately the God in the Bible, you know, is a, you know reference to some off-world force or entity. Now, here's the here's the thing though. The Bible really pushes the idea of monotheism, the belief in one God. But that happened by on you know, that switch happened on purpose and it was done so uh because they wanted to break away from the belief that there were many gods at one point. Matter of fact, one group in particular, you know, all ties, uh, you know, through pieces of information back to this original progenitor group, the people that really, you know, changed the course of this planet, planet's evolution, they wanted that eliminated. 
and because they wanted to go into hiding because they needed to for their own protection and so that they can control everything. That's who these secret societies are today, you know, the Illuminati, the, you know, the, 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 the Freemasons. The Freemasons were infiltrated by the Bavarian Illuminati around the same time that this country was founded. Mm-hmm. So, and there's facts, and, you know, proven that, you know. So, but there are facets of the Illuminati all over the globe, you know, every continent. And, and every continent on this planet where there is a mega, mega wealthy industrialist, you know, multi-billionaire, you know, there's a connection to the Illuminati. Mm-hmm. You know, people people want to think, oh, well, the Illuminati is this group of Western European, you know, blonde, blue-eyed white guys. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. The Illuminati is about controlling bloodlines with a specific genetic uh, trait. It has nothing to do with the way you look. It has what to, has to do with what's within your bloodline. And they're all over the place. On every continent, and we're going to start finding. We're going to start finding stuff on a continent where supposedly no one lives, and there where there's never been anyone. I'm talking about Antarctica. Pretty soon, we're going to start finding with this, with, with you know, with the planet heating up the way it's heating up, and with you know, the, you know, the the loss of these massive glaciers all over the place. You know, even in South America. In the Andes and the places where, you know, there's these glaciers that have been there for, for as long as we've known, you know, oh, they're all melting. They're all melting. This is the hottest decade. This has been the hottest year in the history of recorded weather. I don't know if you're aware of that or not. No, but, I wasn't. Yeah, this, this, this uh, last year was the hottest year in the history of, of weather being recorded on this planet. And it's no surprised that the glaciers are melting and that the ice shelf in Antarctica are melting. And we're going to see things. You know, there's pyramids that were discovered, you know, and there were pyramids that were just discovered in Antarctica. They're not telling us about it yet. Just like they're not, not telling us about the massive pyramid, crystal pyramid, that was found off the coast of the Bahamas. I mean, there, there's pyramids all over this planet. Pyramids are a universal our universal, uh, you know, sign and telltale presence of a group that was here before us. You know, I'm telling you, there, there's a lot that's about to be, you know, released, but accidentally. You know, stuff that they've been trying to hide from us, it's going to make it out on its own. Here's another question, Max, from the chat room, since you were talking about pyramids underwater. What about underwater alien bases? What no, do you know about yeah. them? Yeah, there there are under there are underwater bases. They're not alien bases, but they do have alien technology. Doctor Richard Souter uh, talks about this extensively. He's absolutely right. There are underwater bases uh, off the coast of California. There's the uh, there's the uh, the Monterey Shelf. You know, just off the Monterey Shelf, uh, there's a a, a, deep, a steep drop off, and there's a base right there. There's a base off. Um, Right there in the Bahamas, there's a base. Uh, there's a base right um, uh, in the Caribbean. There's a base. There's there's bases, underwater bases everywhere. So when people see these UFOs that are rising out, or these USOs um, yep. arising out of the water, you're saying they are they're a reverse engineered craft, essentially. Then, or they uh, just... it, no, they're not, they're not reverse engineered craft. They're actually human craft, but they're leveraging. Uh, alien technologies uh, that we get through this technological exchange program. Believe it or not, a lot of technologies that surround you today in your home right now um, came out through inventions that happened uh, through various private sector firms. The, the technology actually came from the great and dull state. And it happened to the Technology Commercialization Office, uh, which operates out of Elmos. It's funny, but a lot of the patents and a lot of the technologies originate in New Mexico, and it ends up in our homes everywhere. I just thought you'd throw close the air around inventions. Actually, that was good. Um, the, you know, there's a company out there called Alienware. It's, mm-hmm. I, you might, you're probably familiar with it. With the yeah, they're making mean, and I, so, I mean, they're telling you. They're telling you right there, obviously. 
it's right there, you know. That they're telling it's possible, you it's, it's possible that, you know, they they make a really they make a really nice set of laptops, that's for damn sure. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean you know, there could be some hidden symbology there. Um <clears throat> kinda like a joke, you know, set up to throw it in our face, you know, that alienware is the you know, well the bottom line is alienware is leveraging extraterrestrial technology, or at least great technology. Because when you read UFO Highway, and by the way, my book is available at ufohighway.com. I don't know if we mentioned that to anybody. No, we didn't, and we were going to get to it, but that's good. Yeah, if you go to ufohighway.com, that's where you can get my book. And uh, <laughs> if you read the book, there's a whole section on Lieutenant Colonel Phil Corso. You know, everybody tries to say that, oh, he lied about this, he lied about that. It's funny how the people that said he was lying are the people that we know have been on the CIA payroll, like Stephen Friedman, for instance. Okay, Douglas Dietrich just spoke at the UFO conference right here in Santa California, who I, I heard, by the way, got into it with uh, Richard Dolan on the panel, because uh, I guess they didn't like one another or whatever. But <clears throat> And Douglas is kind of out there. But Douglas worked at the Presidio in San Francisco where he was charged with destroying all of the classified documentation that made it through that facility. And he said that he saw in the 1990s that Stan Friedman, our favorite UFO expert, the guy who dropped the mic conference, uh, who's in business with Scott Ramsey, who happens to be friends with the guy that's launching this campaign against me, those are the same guys that are also saying that Lieutenant Colonel Phil Corso was a liar and that he had nothing to do with the reverse engineering Nearing, uh, reverse engineered alien technology. But when we leave you on highway, the colonel essentially intellectually body slams every one of their arguments, including what Mr. Alejandro Rojas of Open Minds thinks, okay? Because that guy, he's an idiot too. I'm calling him out right now. He's a complete idiot for, you know, for, for immediately jumping on the side of these so called, you know, uh, UFO experts. Oh, I don't agree with the providence of that data. Well, you know what, dude? Get a life. Okay, stop hosting these little these little UFO conferences and stop doing these stupid little TV shows and you know get with the program. Stop researching it. Read the UFO again and look into those facts instead of just immediately siding because you're worried about what Stanton Friedman and these other guys are going to say. It's bullshit. I'm sick of this UFO community. I'm sick of this UFO establishment and how all of them are so worried about their little conferences and you know feeding off the table scraps of one another, especially those that have been around since the 1970s. You know you know what? Ufology 2.0, the phrase was coined by a good friend of mine, uh, and uh, it, it, it's here already. So the next phase of ufology has already stepped up, and we're, we're exposing all of these frauds that are out there. Wow, those are pretty strong words. So do, are, you, are you making the to exopolitics then? No, not really. I'm going to stay grounded with what, I, what you know, with just with what I know, you know, and I'm going to defend what I know, defend the people that have provided me the data that they that they've given. And look, I mean, even with the UFO community, you got people. You know, everybody hates one another. Nobody wants to work with one another until they're in business with one another. Okay, let me let me let me give you a funny little story here. Please. Kennedy Freeman went out of his way to literally destroy Bob Lazar. You remember Bob Lazar, right? Yes. The guy that worked at Area 51 who claimed he was a physicist who was at Alamos. George Knapp did his due diligence and found that the guy really was a physicist at Alamos. He was in the directory there. There were people that knew him there. There was even a newspaper article, you know, Showing you know Bob Lazar with this uh, you know this vehicle this jet powered vehicle that he had created and even clearly stated that he was a physicist at Los Alamos. <laughs> then <clears throat> when Bob Lazar came forth with his information on Area 51, somebody within the government made an attempt to destroy his credibility, wipe his identity, and just literally erase him from the mind's eye. Right. Mm-hmm. That's the information that Stan Friedman was working with. Stan Friedman was you know, literally, if you go to YouTube and you type in Stan Friedman Bob Lazar, 
you'll hear Stan Friedman now. He talked to the junior college professor. He talked to the, you know, the professor at this at MIT or whatever, and nobody's heard of him. Well, that's the way the government works. When they don't want you to know something, they threaten you, and they, you know, they, they threaten the, or the, they threaten those that you love, you know, over pieces of information that are critical to their secrecy. Okay, so where I'm going with this. Is is really gonna is really gonna uh, you know make a lot of people aware and it's gonna wake their asses up. Okay, so Stanton Friedman, who's part of this whole you know establishment, this UFO establishment, you know, this, this, the expert who's been telling the same damn story for the last 25 years at every conference that he goes to. That's the reason why I was trying to get him at my conference, so I could throw him up on a panel and I could throw some hardcore questions at him that he couldn't dodge, right? But <clears throat> anyhow. But he dropped out of my conference, whatever. Here's just the point I'm trying to make. Bob Lazar somehow ended up with a government contract. He ended up with he ended up with a company today that sells nuclear supplies to the United States federal government and the United States military. Matter of fact, on Bob Lazar's website it clearly states Orders to the United States military take precedence over domestic c- civilian orders. Huh. For somebody that they tried to wipe their identity, for somebody who, who, <laughs> I mean, you see where I'm going with this, David? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the guy has so much information, he did the absolute right thing by going to George Knapp, you know, going to Bob, to John Lear, Getting his story out there, getting his face in the news, getting his face in the public's mind. That, I mean, he did. He did what they they were worried he was going to do, and mm-hmm. now they can't kill him. Now they can't get rid of him. How they know that they're they're going to admit to everything that he was saying about F four at Area fifty one. So instead, they get him this nice little company out of Michigan, far away from Los Alamos, far away from you know you know. Far away from everything over here, you know where the you know the uh, where the establishment you know works pretty much, and uh, they 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 he's, he's, um, selling. I mean, it's just amazing. I mean, some of the things that the guy's selling are alien technologies. So, so I mean, like, people so, can go and Google, they can Google this. I mean, this information is out there, or where they can Google Bob Lazar's website. Yeah, Bob Lazar. He he had a company today. Uh, I think it's called like um, United Nuclear or something like that. Uh, let, let me let me see if I can get it, pick it up real fast. Uh, yeah, yeah, UnitedNuclear.com. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, if you go to United, it's Scientific Equipment and Supplies. And uh, for a guy that was uh, essentially left jobless, you know, who had no degrees any longer, right? They he, he's doing just fine. He's just doing he's doing just fine. Well, that's really fascinating. You know, Stanton Friedman was my first guest on the show ever way back when I started, and um, he really poo-pooed the whole notion that there was anything adult say at all. Um, and 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 Bob Lazar as well. Just for FYI, um, so it's kind of interesting to hear you trash him on air. Um, because I, 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 I'm, I'm not trash, uh, I'm not trashing Bob Lazar. Bob Lazar was the real deal. Oh no, not Bob Lazar. Stan Friedman, of course, but yeah. yeah. Um, but I was I was a little disappointed with my interview with him because I felt like there was more information that he was holding on to that was not forthcoming, uh, for sure. Um, here's a question from the chat room. Does Anthony oh, Lee? Uh, let me let me let me let's tell you something. Yeah. You know what you know what aerogel is? Aerogel, no. Aerogel is, is is it comes from silicon dioxide, same material as ordinary glass. Except it's one thousand times less dense, and you literally—I mean, you can you can fire a blowtorch at this thing. Like if you had a aerogel pad on your hand, you can fire an aerogel. You, know, you can fire a blowtorch at the aerogel, and it will have no effect on your hand. And as a matter of fact, at the United Nuclear website. Um, there are there are, there are visuals of this. And the aerogel uh, is essentially this uh, substance that was created, you know, by aliens, given to NASA, 
And uh, it's alien technology. I mean, this is some crazy stuff. And Bob Lazar is now selling that stuff to the federal government and to the U.S. military and U.S. defense contractors. It's alien technology. It's right there on his website. It's crazy. It is absolutely crazy. That is pretty fascinating. My goodness. Um, what is that? What? United Nuclear? Dot com. Dot com. United Nuclear dot com. Folks, check it out. Um, the question is, do you believe that we have technology, or we're just talking about technology, do we have that, there, that we have the technology to eliminate the need for oil and gas, fossil fuels? Well, fossil fuels. Yeah. Um, long time ago, I believe I believe many scientists throughout uh, academia here in the United States and Europe and all over the planet have already discovered it. And every time that they are about to announce their remarkable discovery, they go they go missing. They end up found dead through suicide. Yeah, yeah. We've already we've already found ways to circumvent you know. Uh, Power through fossil fuels, to, you know, through, you know, power to the utilization of of uh, fossil fuels. That's already been discovered. The technology exists. Um, the government has it, but they don't want us to have it. They don't want anyone in the private sector to have it, because the remember that group we were talking about, the the Illuminati, the mm-hmm. the elitists. They mm-hmm. control. They control the. Um, you know, British Petroleum, Royal Dutch Petroleum, all the companies are owned by the royal families, by the Rothschilds, by the Rockefellers. You know, that's where a lot of that money comes from. So if you if you put those companies out of work, it's going to make a lot of these elitists really pissed off. And uh, well, they're in power anyway, so that's that's why everybody ends up dead or missing. It's going, to, it's going to make them poor. And my goodness, how would, how would they be able to handle that? Yeah. Well, no, I don't think they can ever be. I don't think they can ever go poor. You remember back in the 1930s when the United States government uh, made it illegal to own gold, and, and you were forced to turn in your gold. You know, as part of the war effort. Mm-hmm. That that was actually the Rothschilds at work. Okay, there are these massive subterranean caverns owned by the Rothschilds, where all the world's gold really is. Why do they want all the gold? Because it is the only the only you know. True uh, substance. Uh, you know, this is the only true thing of value to them. Um, one, I think it's for it's for off-world purposes. I don't even think they want it for you know uh, jewelry. For bling you know. yeah. Yeah, for them it, it serves a whole other purpose altogether. It's an off-world purpose, and but they're they're the ones that are. Hard. I mean, look, we went into went into Iraq, and what was one of the first things we did? We you know after we killed Saddam Hussein is we located all of his gold. And where's that gold now? We don't know. It's missing. It ain't at Fort Knox because there is no gold in Fort Knox. There hasn't been any gold there since the late seventies to early nineteen eighty. Yeah. 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 And we plundered the museum. We plundered the Iraqi museum too. So whatever gold was in there is gone as well. Was the, that's one of the real reasons why we were in Iraq, because all of that information that was sitting there in those museums was really pretty much only high-level a- academic, you know, professors and archaeology, you know, archaeology and anthropology and whatever got limited access to it. Well, mm-hmm. we wanted to make sure we got access. Nobody got access to it. Yeah. That's why Iraq, you know, <laughs> instead of guarding the oil fields, you know what we were actually guarding? The, the, the museums. We were actually mm. going to museums. Yeah, a lot of people are not aware of that fact. When we first, when we first went in the Gulf War, the, the first Gulf War, when we first went in, we were not guarding the. We didn't give a damn about the oil. Do you really we one care about the oil in Iraq? Look, remember I said we were for over eleven years. If we really wanted oil, we need the well where to get the oil. We got it from Libya in less than three months. We were never there for Anthony, you have three minutes to talk about the book a little bit more. Tell people what's in it, what they can expect, because I think it's a great book. I think it's something people should really look up and, and, and purchase. So you can yeah, in you, a little bit more about what else you have in the book. Yeah, UFO Highway is a really good book. And it covers a lot of the information with regards to the event that took place in 1979, but it's more important than that. Because if you read the Human Origins section and if you read the Dulcie interview 
and you, you start to put the pieces together and you see a correlation between the information that was outed in Dulce. As a matter of fact, it's it's ironic, but it was a an expert from Iraq, Dr. Tahab uh, 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 Bahir, who translated everything for us before it was shipped off to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. All these archaeological tablets that had this strange, advanced, you know, Akkadian Kaneiform-like, uh, you know, uh, system that was decipherable. Um, <laughs> I think what's important is that, you know, uh, people read the book. You can go to ufohighway.com to get a copy of the book. Uh, my my next book is Project Leonid, which is going to be coming out. And, and if you go to projectleonid.com, it's L-E-O-N-I-D, like the name Leonid, like the Russian name Leonid. It doesn't stand for it's – it's not the name Leonid. It stands for Low Earth Orbit Nanosatellite Interceptor Defense, projectleonid.com. There will be an announcement, you know, about my entire social network when that book is ready. That book is going to expose so much about what happened in Iraq, what happened in uh, Libya, what happened uh, in what's happening in China. The fact that we discovered that there are 3,500 miles of magnetically shielded and electronically grounded underground state of the facilities in China. Um, you know, I mean, that, that even prompted a congressional hearing. I mean, there's a lot of information that's going to come out, and uh, I'm going to be sharing that with everybody. What do you think is going to happen here in 2012? You know what? I, you know, I, I'm not one of them 2012ers like Scotty Roberts. My friend Scotty Roberts calls them the 2012ers. I, I don't know. I, I, I never bought into the idea that the world was going to end in 2012. I think what's happening is 2012 is going to be the beginning of, you know, just a new phase of, our, of humanity, that's all. I, I just think it's a new phase of humanity. Whether it's good or bad, that's up to us. That is up to us. Okay, that's fine. Fantastic. Thank you so much. If you want to hang in there to the other side of the show, Anthony, I'll get to say goodbye to you off air. Um, wow, this was an exciting start, but you know what? We ended up the show and ended up with some great information. It's a great book. I hope you guys go to UFOHighway.com. Colonel X, and and uh, let's just let's just start from the beginning. First of all, why did you write this book? When I first started writing UFO Highway, it had nothing to do with Dulcy. That's a big thing that most people have to try to readily understand right off the top. It had nothing to do with Dulcy. Everything about UFO Highway had to do with Area 51, uh, human origins, and uh, some work that I had been doing on something called transient digital audio phenomena. Um. Uh, Dulcie came about in 2010 when I had this encounter, uh, this meeting with this gentleman. Well, he was a retired United States Air Force colonel. Um, but the reason why, to answer your question, the reason why I wrote the book uh, was because I had already been doing a lot of research in uh, ufology, um, following you know the whole Area 51 phenomena, uh, you know local triangle UFO sightings here in California, which I thought were the you know, the TR-3B1 and TR-3B whatever, you know, just a bunch of different craft that I knew about, was learning about from people like Michael Schratt and various others. Um, so I was trying to consolidate a lot of information that I had on Area 51 and what my feelings, what my thoughts and feelings are, uh, were on Area 51. Then this guy that I had worked with at a semiconductor company pops back into my life, uh, gets me in touch with this colonel, and the rest is history. That portion of the book has seemed to have taken hold uh, into, you know, the UFO community, and um, it is what it is. It's UFO Highway, and it's um, something that I I don't regret doing it. Um, you know, sometimes I feel bad that my human origin section gets overlooked, mm. but um, mm. that, that, that's, that's why I did uh, UFO Highway, the book. Well, most people are more, I, I think everybody is this, this air of mystery. First, it was Area 51, like, whoa, Area 51, you know. And then Dulce started coming into play. And, and then, you know, I guess you know, I, I was just reading in the intro that this whole, because I was going to ask you about this on air, and we might as well just address it right, a little bit right now, this whole Thomas Costello um, bit of, of 
yeah. information in that interview. Uh-huh. What, about, what about that interview, first of all? Because I read it, I was like, whoa, this is intense. Um, is it real? Um, how much does that interview sort of mesh with what uh, Colonel X had to tell On the spot determinations, whether certain individuals were, you know, able to return to duty or, or whether they were fit to, you know, return to duty or not. Um, uh, he had the power to, you know, discharge people from the military immediately or send them to prison or send them to hospitals, you know, whatever it took to get people that were no longer functioning on a, on a, uh, on a you know, at, at, at a level that the military was, you know, expecting of them, you know, out of the picture. So right. in 1979, he went to Edwards Air Force Base where he met up with another group of individuals uh, and then he flew into a classified location called Dulce. He had never heard of Dulce, didn't know where the hell it was. Uh, matter of fact, everything he was learning about Dulce was on the trip there uh, from Edwards Air Force Base. Once they got to Dulce, everything became clear to him. He thought that they were that all of the briefing documentation was talking about a Native American community mm-hmm. that lived inside of these caverns there. Then Mm -hmm. it became aware to him that these were not Native Americans that they were talking about. These were greys. These were grey aliens. Or alien to him, aliens of some sort. He didn't know anything about greys or anything at that point. He knew about the the whole UFO phenomena, but he didn't know about interaction with greys, you know, between the the military at that point. So that's yeah. The, the, there was a battle in Dulce, and that's why I believe the Thomas the Thomas Costello uh, information was put out there. By the way, Phil Schneider really did work there. Phil Schneider was really a part of that whole story. Now, Phil Schneider came about after the Thomas Edwin Costello uh, business, you know. But again, that stuff was put out there as disinformation in case the real story ever got out. Phil Schneider gave bits and pieces of the tr- of the of the real story. Um, some of it he was di- he was uh, he too was guilty of putting out a little bit of disinfo. But I mean, he really was telling the truth. But what he did was is he thought he was protecting himself by omitting certain pieces. Mm-hmm. But it didn't, didn't matter. They still killed him anyway. And he really did work at Dulce, and the colonel confirmed this. Mm. Okay. So- but you're sure through, um, I guess, through the light test and, uh, and or that two, two light test. Two light test, okay. Right. But, but Which I still program. have, I still have the results of those polygraph examinations to talk to is me. And I, the reason why he refuses to talk to me, I, I mean, I'm speculating on this, but it's because the colonel knew him and he worked with the colonel. Uh, the colonel worked with with John Lear back when John Lear was doing you know stuff for the CIA. So, and, and he's mentioned in the book UFO Highway, and that's why John Lear won't talk to me. Um, I, I sent him my phone number. I've sent him my email address. He's good close personal friends with Kerry Cassidy, who I'm close personal friends with, but it just uh, never materializes. So you tell me, why won't he talk to me? It's because in the book he's mentioned. And it just a little, it's just a little bit too close to home for him. And why he participates in the disinformation story, you know, with the, these, uh, you know, this whole Thomas Edwin Costello business, I don't know. He doesn't need – maybe it's because he's frightened. Who knows? I don't know. Well, let's maybe, know that- maybe he believes it. Maybe he believes it. Maybe he believes it. Well, does anybody out there really have 100% of the information? And my question is this um, – because you know, yeah, it, it, it's hard really sometimes to know who's got the disinfo and who doesn't have the disinfo, um, and and I don't know how people really are, are able to really pick from that. But back again to the whole thing with Costello. So is what he had to say is what Colonel X had to say because obviously we I I don't I don't know and I didn't get a chance to read the book beforehand. Is it that different? Was there no war? For instance, was there no war between the Greys and the humans and in, in, in those Well, that's areas? why I'm calling. Well, that's why I'm calling it disinformation because there was a battle there. 1979. That's why the colonel was in Dulce in the first place. He was working out of uh, McClellan Air Force Base uh, here in Northern California, North Highlands, California, which is just north north 
east of Sacramento, California. And North Highlands uh, today is it's it's uh, it's now a civilian, you know, place of commerce. It's not even a military base anymore. But the Air Force Base at the time was pretty damn busy. And in 1979, he was working with a group, a classified group that responded. It was a medical detachment, a classified medical detachment that responded to what he said were Type X events. And Type X events were kind of imagine the X Files inside the military. That's what this was. That's what this was. So if something of a mysterious, you know, nature occurred, like an accident or a death or some type of a catastrophe. His job was to be deployed there immediately where he would make, um, you know, uh, okay. And I'm still in touch with the person who gave the polygraph examination. Matter of fact, that person also put me in touch with another resource who is, who's done over 1,800, uh, 1800 uh, forensic document examinations for the FBI here in California for offices out of San Jose, Sacramento, San Francisco, to validate the authenticity of the documentation that I have. What is the documentation that I have? I have a DD-214 document, which is the military discharge document of the colonel, <coughs> which shows that he was, in fact, somewhere called Rio Riva Scientific you know, Technological uh, underground Auxiliary. Well, Rio, Rio Ox is what it's called, and it's in Rio Riva County. Now, those are the clues that are that tell us that there's something there in Dulce. I called the people in Dulce, you know, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and they said that there's nothing there. Um, I guess there's a whole bunch of people out there that are claiming to have taken this document and found that it was a fraud. It was a, it's a fake document. I'm telling you right now, that's bullshit. And there's a lot of there's a lot of proof that these guys are being paid off by somebody to launch this disinfo, you know, this, again, another disinformation campaign. Who in their right mind is going, to, who are you going to trust more? <clears throat> I filed a standard, for, a, stand, a standard Form 180 with the uh, National Personnel Records Center, sent it to them. I had done so many times before through owning my own software company and a California multiple awards schedule. All of this is verifiable through the state of California, you could call the you could call the state of Cal, call up the state of California and verify all of this. Mm-hmm. I have filed and I have had expedite DD two fourteen uh, documents expedited through filing the standard form one eighty. So I knew the process. It's to verify whether or not a person <coughs> is <coughs> legitimately <coughs> excuse me <coughs> legitimately an active duty reservist or a retired from the from uh, from uh, service. You know, because when you when you go when you put out a bid on a contract or request for proposal or request for offer, you get points when you hire veterans, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I did the process. I went through it uh, with the with the assistance of the colonel. I went through it. I got the the, the DD two fourteen back. I showed it to, to, to quite a few people. There are actual people that held this document. Uh, in Angel Fire, New Mexico, when I was really naive at the time, when I was first coming out, well, when I when I well when I started looking into Dulce, um, the the first thing I wanted to know was just Th- Thomas Edwin Costello, right? I wanted to know everything I could about the guy, what the the whole John Lear connection was to Ann West, what was the Ann West connection to Thomas Costello, who was Bruce Allen Walton. You know, and uh, what what is this information? What information, if any, does John Rhodes have? You know, besides hearsay and behind, besides everybody else's information on Dulcie, um, and that's what that's that's what I wanted to know, just like you know everybody else. And what I found was through talking to the colonel is that Thomas Edwin Costello does not exist, nor does his son, nor does his wife. I personally did extensive research on trying to find uh, such a person. You know, supposedly he was a sergeant in the military, um, in the Air Force. I tried looking uh, in the uh, the U.S. Uh, Social Security Death Index. So, I mean, everywhere that I could look to try and find, uh, you know, the existence of this person, including the town that he was born in, 
nothing turned up. You know, I found I ended up finding a Thomas E. Costello in Roswell, New Mexico, of all places, but it, it wasn't him. It, it didn't match up. The age didn't match up, and uh, <coughs> and so I'm not for certain that that person exists. I'm, well, I believe I believe that the whole Thomas Costello. And all that information is disinfo. It's disinformation that was put out there because in case the real story ever got out, like the the colonel's information, which is, I believe, 100% real, the, the Bruce Allen Walton, the Branton story, or the Jason Bishop, the Tal LaBeth story, all that information, that's disinfo. Everything that John Lear has and Ann West, what they have is disinformation. You know, I, I'm a big fan of John Lear's, actually. I've been following John Lear for a long time. And, you know, I I follow up closely on all the work that he does with re- respects to the moon. Mm-hmm. I know for a fact that there's a moon base. I know that there's a gray base being operated there. I know that there's facilities and whatnot on the moon. Mm-hmm. Strangely enough, John Lear absolutely refuses to talk to me. He he does interviews all the time on YouTube, blog talk, radio, every radio show you can imagine. But the one person he refuses 